Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our Bible study on May 2nd. And the moderator today is Connie. Go ahead, Connie. Um, the lesson is Everlasting Punishment, and uh, the topic is Words Matter. Our quote is from Martha Wilcox. There is no one in all the world who has used words with such significance of meaning as Mary Baker Eddy. She was a student of the dictionary, and we should use the dictionary and the concordances when we study Christian science literature. As we do this, we find that the spiritual meaning revealed through words has the seed within itself, and when active as our thought, will revolutionize our thinking and our world. The first question is, um, what are presumptuous sins? I kind of leaped on that one and passed over secret faults. But So if anybody has any thoughts on secret faults also, feel free. <laughs> um, I looked it up, uh, presumptuous, in the dictionary, the um, 1828, and it said bold, confident, and confident to excess, arrogant, insolent, unduly confident, irreverent to... Um, with regard to sacred um, things, willful. Um, but I, but really, uh, when I looked this up on the uh, Biblos, uh, where you have all the different uh, Bible translations, over on the right side, it had a quote from Numbers, which I thought was really good. Um, but anyone who sins defiantly, whether native-born or foreigner, blasphemes the Lord and must be cut off from the people of Israel. I also found um, it said thinking you can continue living in sin and get away with it. (laughs) (laughs) I found something. It's deliberate disobedience. Thank you. I found that premeditated intentional thank you I have that uh, I found in a concordance that it's when we cannot recognize our own errors that's a good one the whole idea of being presumptuous means you're gonna step into a place where you got no business going there and uh, What came to my mind was Jesus' very clear and simple instruction, judge not, that you be not judged. That kind of goes along with that. We think we're too big, we think we know what's right for everybody else, and go around letting them know it. We've (laughs) stepped in some place when we really shouldn't be going there. That's where a rebuke, uh, uh, you know, an honest rebuke, can be very helpful to someone who doesn't realize they're committing a sin. <laughs> yes. Sometimes it's two by four when they're really <laughs> quite stubborn about it. I had mentioned to you a while this Charles Spurgeon, who was a contemporary of Mrs. Eddy. He's actually quoted in early journals. Uh, and he was a really a wonderful minister. If you read any of his, you can Google him. Anyway, he, he wrote a whole a big uh, sermon on this presumptuous sin. Said what oh. many of you have already said. Go ahead. What was his last name? Spurgeon. S-P- oh, Spurgeon. Charles Spurgeon. Oh, okay. He said that every sin has a venom of rebellion. And then he said... Kind of, there are four times, four kinds of these uh, presumptuous sins which you have mentioned. He said the first was a sin committed willfully against manifest light and knowledge. Um, so when you know better, and this is one you know really to take to heart is as if you name the name of Christian Science and you know better. And yet you continue. For instance, and this I apply this to myself, when I continue to be fearful, when I continue to be negative, 
even though I was saying all these words that, you know, fear not and God loves me and uh, all, all of the p things that I knew in science, but I continued to do it. That is a presumptuous sin, and it does have a penalty. All of these things, if once you're naming the name Christian Science and you willfully do it anyway, gossiping, not loving your neighbor as yourself, all of these things, this, this statement we should apply directly to our own hearts and souls and seriously give ourselves a, a raking over. It's much better if you didn't know, if you didn't know what you were doing was wrong. Much better. But when you know what you're doing is wrong and you continue to do it, you are presumptuous and you are arrogant, willful, and uh, committing willfully, a sin committed willfully against light and knowledge. And in this, in this sermon, he even says, if you have a friend that tells you or a mother that is telling you what's right and what's wrong and you still disobey, presumptuous sin. And then, and then the second one, he says, is one of deliberation. You know, that you are deliberately doing something against someone else. Not ignorantly, but deliberately. Malicious mental malpractice. You know darn well what you're doing, but you do it anyway. Something revengeful. And don't think just because you're a Christian or even a Christian scientist that you're above any of this. And then the third, he said, was a, a matter of design. And he said, really, disobeying in defiance to God. I mean, there again, you, you take something that you know that God is saying not to do, or, uh, you know, like a commandment, and, and you deliberately do it. And I've, and I've seen people who think that they're above the law, that they're beyond... No, because they're Christian scientists, they can get a, they can they can get away with stuff, which is a per, total perversion. You know, but then there are you know there are religions uh, that say, well, you know, it's it, it, as long as you confess your sin, then you're you know then you're okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and then they go do it again. Well, <laughs> it's not limited to Catholics. <laughs> I think another common one that people fall short of, I mean, I've, I've been, um, I've found myself doing it too, which I think is making joke of or fun of somebody in a very in a very funny way, I will use the word funny way, and laugh about it. But even though you know it's wrong, but if you use like that funny way to how somebody is feeling without caring about that person. And people think, oh, because uh, it's funny, it's not wrong. Um, it, it's really dangerous because you, you can hurt somebody very deeply. Yeah. Yes, yeah. you can. I've seen this joking around in the sense of humor, mask, attempt to mask the worst of malice. Horrific, malicious things can be done under the guise of humor. Yes, never make a joke at the expense of anyone else. It's not funny. Yeah, and I think the last one that Spurgeon mentioned was a sin committed through a fancied strength of mind. I think that's what Gary was talking about, thinking you're above the law. Or, or you, can, you can do it. You're, you're in control of the situation. You can go to that um, den of sin, <laughs> and you'll be okay. You'll, you'll be in control. Or you can watch that really violent, lustful movie, and you, you're all right. That's okay. You're, you're above it all. You can deal with it. Presumptuous sins. And think about it, because we're not here talking about the other person. We're directing this, this light, onto yourself. Make sure that there's not anything 
of that in you. And if there is, then that's the time to make sure you correct it and deal with it and don't go there. Because as a scientist, you should know better. And there is a penalty when you know better and you do it anyway. And it's not God punishing you. It's the era punishing itself. Are you talking to each other? Are you talking to, each other? Are you talking to yourself, story? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Remember, you're live with us. <laughs> yeah, we're recording your every word. So we can't help it. <laughs> Anyone else on the presumptuous sense? It's a very important thing to understand. Uh, another example is uh, people in a position of uh, authority, well, authority position, I don't know if that's the right term, um, and they use that position to, to commit sin. Yes. And, and it can relate to what you just said. But yes, terrible. Yeah. Terrible. Arrive to power and then to, to misuse it. And, and we've seen it. We see it today. We've seen it in our history. That's why you be careful who, you, who we allow to get into office. We pray over these things diligently. We must, and we must never be remiss or, you know, even think it's, well, we'll pray about the elections the day before the elections. Not, no, we're... Begin now that knowing God is raising up the right person, a God-fearing person, that will direct our country, our nation, and and also for the world. And that anyone that isn't God-fearing will destroy itself. Will not succeed. I I wanted to say something about that. I think that a lot of people think that they uh, put their time into their uh, their hygienic ideas of sanitation or, or they think that they are just uh, doing things a certain way that everything is fine. Um, of course, you know, we, we are wise about what we do, but we also have to think about... Um, you know, what goes into our minds are probably far more uh, problematic than what we, you know, put on our bodies. Good, thank you. Yep. Yeah, that's what yeah. the lesson's all about, isn't it? That's what I, I got yeah. out of the lesson. Thank you. What then, what then, anyone want to speak on secret faults? I looked it up and it was written as hidden, covered, or concealed sin, unconscious, unseen, so it's permitted to grow unchecked. Thank you. What a definition. Yeah. <laughs> That's excellent. And that is why Mrs. Eddy says, does anyone know what quote I'm looking for? <laughs> Era uncovered. It's <laughs> And the final third destroys itself. Yes. This is why we root the era out. This is why it helps to have a practitioner or a friend or others who will help you see the, the sin that you are, do not see. Or think that you can hide and not let anybody else see. <laughs> That's a big one. Please do not do that. Please don't think you're going to get away with some little thing and, and have some secret between you and another. Or even to tell your practitioner not to say something. Uh, uh-uh. One thing Mrs. Evans was cr crazy about here, and in a, I see why. No secrets. No right. secrets. Anytime anyone tells me I, ha I don't tell anyone or I've got a secret, I just want to go to the rooftop and shout it all over. <laughs> so don't ever tell me anything that you want to think is a secret. I don't, I'm the wrong person to tell. I'm, I'm stating my case here. If you want everybody to know, do that exact thing. <laughs> <laughs> Secrets are, go underground. They hide a multitude of sins. Now, I'm not saying there's, there are, certainly are times, and I respect 
patient confidentiality sort of a thing. But but no, th this idea, don't tell anybody, and I have something, you know, no. You, you need to get that out, out into the light of day. There should be nothing hidden, and there is nothing hidden that will not be revealed. It will be revealed, so you might as well <laughs> not try. <laughs> and then it will look even worse that you were trying to hide it. And isn't that what a Christian science healing actually is? It's what the transformation takes place and that we're not hiding, that it all comes out in the open. Yes. Exactly. It is. Because once it's out in the open, the light destroys the darkness, and there's nothing ever to fear. It's only pride that wants you to hide it. And, it, and personal sense that says, I've got some personal thing that I don't want anyone to know about. But guess what? God knows it. Guess what? <laughs> yes. <laughs> God is not mocked. Right. Oh. And if it's something that's bad, it was never true about you in the first place. And you don't have to be afraid of getting it out. Thank you. And and you, know, mean, uh, you know, any, no sin or no fault is is singular to any, anybody anyway. It's all over. It's happening everywhere. So it, it's nothing to be ashamed of or anything like that. I mean. Right. And that's why humility is essential. Because if you've got pride about something, then you're going to be ashamed of something that, you know, doesn't look good to other people. And it's all personal sense. And it's all pride. Humility gets it out. says, well, it's, you know, if it isn't of God, it's not part of me, and I'm not, you know, I don't have to be ashamed of it. Because sin also is impersonal. So I remember years ago... Mrs. Evans taught us never to say it's your problem or your sin. Don't attach it to yourself. Not only that, don't attach it to anybody else either. Because it is simply impersonal sin. And seen in that direct, in that light. It's easy to kill it. Because you're not going to be hurting anybody. Yes. And, and here again, this is ad addressing the power of words, too. If you say, my fear or my sin or my even my problem, well, you know, you here you are personalizing that you've got this problem. It's not yours. Nobody's. Watch what you say. And here again, these are the, these are the, hidden, the hidden things we do that we don't realize what we're saying, that we're declaring against ourselves. That's why I always be, I call it raking over your thought, like you would rake a yard for dead leaves. Rake it over. Make sure that stuff isn't growing, collecting. <clears throat> and it's also why recently we've talked so much about motive, to ask yourself, because I know for years I went around running around doing all these things, never questioning my motive, even though I would say, a rule for motives and acts in the morning. I never questioned why I was doing anything I did. And then I began to be really shocked when I took a good, honest look at why I was doing things. Sometimes out of fear, sometimes out of pride, sometimes out of pleasing other people. But the motive was not a, not good. I had to see it and change that motive. Hidden, secret, false. Anybody else? It, it feels good to me to, I, I feel like I'm in the process of getting rid of all that secrecy and I'm quite happy about it. So. It's, a it's a great <laughs> relief. And it's also, it's like, welcome to the human race. <laughs> because when you're trying so hard to, to this, uh, be this perfect person that you don't want anybody to know that you've ever had a bad thought in your life or you've done anything wrong and you have to put up this front all the time. It's so exhausting. It's so unreal. It's so untrue. It's so wrong. So. And, and also sometimes when you, when you share some of those thoughts, uh, um, you know, they go those sequences. And sometimes you find out that it's not actually a big problem. It's not a big problem after all. Yeah. As you have thought, I mean, you're going, okay, well, I'm, yeah. well, I'm, I might be holding this That's inside. Great. I mean, That's so true. 
it's a relief. You build it up in your mind. You think you've got this huge problem, and then you get it out, and you realize, no, it's not any big problem, and others have had it before, and big deal, and get rid of it. But it's only when you do keep it in secret that it grows. I think that's why a lot of times people want to be loners. Yeah, so their hidden agenda doesn't come out. Thank you. Exactly. That, Thank that's you. a really good point because, you know, this is the value of a good church, for example. When people are thinking correctly about one another, they, they catch each other. They watch each other's back. And when these secret, quote, secret faults appear, they somebody will catch it and help you out of it if you're willing to be helped out of it. And when people are not willing to be helped out of it, they leave and they become a loner. And that's the danger of being a loner. I, you know, I once loved being a loner and I longed to be a loner for all those reasons. I didn't want anyone to get to know me. I didn't want my secret faults to come out. I had trouble getting along with people. It was just much better just to stay by myself, think my own thoughts, not not have to deal with others. And it was so, uh, such bondage, such misery. And unhappiness. Yes. You can't, you can't be happy if you're not doing stuff for others and working with others in a good way. Because you are the image of love. That's how God created you, to love others. He didn't create you to just be sitting in your prayer chair by yourself 24-7. We're the one idea of the one mind. Yes. And really, there's nothing that can't be worked out among brethren. It might Sometimes it takes a while. Sometimes maybe you have to back off. Sometimes maybe, you know, you've got to deal with a situation that's not that great, but it'll it'll work itself out. If if you're working in the truth, it will work out. It always does. And I've been here long enough to know that. So thank you all. Those were good things said. Anyone else or should we go on? How are we doing, Connie? Great. <laughs> okay, how do you put off the conversation of the old man, and how do you put on the conversation of the new man? I think we've covered that quite a lot already, but... <laughs> <laughs> well, there's one thing that came to my mind when I read this question. That's the bad habit of thinking about the past, continuing to think about what went on way back when, and what I should have done instead of it and being consumed by that. And what's better is to, to look forward. Dear God, this is your day and I'm your image. You show me where you want me to go and what you want me to do. And whatever is past is over. The only thing good about the past is what I've learned about it. So I'm going to take that and go forward with it. Thank you. That's a good example. If, if your conversation in your head is always about past past regrets, past this, past that, well, that's the old man's conversation. What are some other examples of the old man's conversation? Open resentment or sure. rehashing stories that are long gone. Good. Or that should be long gone. Right. <laughs> I think, uh, you know, it. One kind of simple-minded answer to this, how do you put off the conversation of the old man? You do that by putting off the old man. <laughs> I mean, what is, what is the old man? Mortal mind. Yeah, yes. it's the wrong concept of Hello, who you are You're back again. or who anybody else is. A habit of judging other people in your thought. Yes, it's a good one. Yeah, because does the new man judge? No. No. He loves his neighbor. 
And in yes. the in Ephesians, uh, it makes a list of the new man, and one of them is speak every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Thank you. I have total transformation. Yeah, yeah, putting off the old man is total transformation, and this is what real science is, is this transformation. And it will transform everything about you. Any other old man conversations? Envy. Thank you. It's a Hatred. big one. Hatred, absolutely. Um, comparing yourself with another. Yes. Jealousy, yes. Pride. Certainly. What did you say, Florence? Condemning yourself. Condemning yourself, you know, feeling. Yes. Condemning yourself. Watch those conversations that go on in your head. This is why sometimes I've asked people that I work with to keep a journal and to write down what's going on in your head. Writing, write down the fears. Write, write it down. Expose it. Otherwise, it just kind of uh, streams through consciousness, uh, and you're not addressing it, dealing it, rec even recognizing it. Write it down. Take a good look, hard look at what, what the devil is trying to tell you, and then do what? Get rid of it. Yes. Okay. Say, shut up, <laughs> and mean it. No, it's no part of you or anyone. But as as also the story goes, you can't you can't just sweep the uh, parlor clean of the devils because then what happens? Seven others rush more. You have to replace it. <laughs> you can't leave it empty. You can't leave it empty. You've left a vacuum and it sucks it right back in. So may, maybe fairly, you have a list of the things of the conversation of the new man. Yes, um, it's putting off lying, speaking truth to your neighbor. Number two, not to be angry or let the sun not go down upon your wrath. Number three, neither give place to the devil. Number four, let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands the thing which is good that he may have to give to him that needeth. And then let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. And, and grieve what? not... Yeah. And, and it goes on. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God by where we are sealed unto the day of redemption. And let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away. That sums it up, but those that list is what. Thank you. And what is what is edifying mean? Um, you know, uplifting, um, clarifying. Yes. Your conversation with another should uplift the other person. The men of the grace unto the hero. Yes. And your conversation to yourself should uplift you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Don't be your own worst enemy, as they say. <laughs> be a good friend <laughs> to yourself. I, I know before coming here, at least 90% of the, my internal conversation was condemning, condemning myself. Because I kept a uh, journal about five years ago, and it pretty much was all of that. Burn <laughs> 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 it, yeah, he threw it out. Burn it. <laughs> yeah, that there's a simple question to ask yourself: Is this a thought from God that loves me or not? And if it's not, then you don't need to have to listen to it, or repeat it, or say it. It's a good indicator of the truth or not. So we, yeah, we, instead of saying all the fearful negative, negative things, we talk about what's 
true and the enduring the good and the true is the lesson says and Mrs. Eddy said. I, I think that 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 supportiveness and upliftingness of the church is one of the things that means a lot to me because before I didn't have a lot of that, of that in my life and that was what sort of made me want to be a loner it's just you know when I'm around people I'm getting grief <laughs> I don't want that I'll just be alone so, yeah you don't want the grief so you yeah. don't want the people to give you grief. So I'm quite happy being around people now so. <laughs> Yes, Jeremy's ever changed. We all have changed. A lot of that has to do with being around the wrong thing at the right place. Right. If you're around the right place, there's no reason why you can be, can be happy about it. Yes. If you are hanging in a bar with people drunk, um, selfish. selfish, thinking about the worst thing in the world. It kind of fits your thinking, too, yeah. and drive you down with that. Yeah. Absolutely. And in that case, it is better to be alone. And Mrs. Eddy says that, too. Better to be alone than to be with people that are dragging you down. You certainly have to correct it. You can't just sit and be in it. And, it, and if after trying to correct it, nothing happens, then you remove yourself from it. And when you're alone, you're alone with your maker. Yeah. And the reality is true. Yeah. And God will bring then, when you make that choice, he'll bring the right people into your life, those that, you know, you have something in common with, those that will edify you and you will edify them. might not happen the next day, but it will happen. That's why these, um, these Bible studies are so incredibly important. I mean, really, to even experience any sort of conversion from the old man into the new man, you have to have some knowledge of the things of spirit, and you can't gain that without a correct understanding of the Bible. And I don't think, I mean, I've been in Christian science for decades, but I don't think I have ever thought as deeply as I have uh, now through these Bible studies about the very kind of things we're talking about right now and just my day-to-day -day living. Um, I want to thank Jeremy for what he shared on the lesson forum this week. Number one, for his openness openness and honesty. Um, I mean, sharing that uh, how he handles his anger and how he's overcome so much of that and talking about how when he's in traffic and getting angry, how he would actually pull over to the side of the road until he overcame that sense. And I thought, you know, how often people get nervous in traffic, stressed out, or feeling like they're rushed. We need to address the, that thought. So you either pull over mentally or even physically until you've handled it. But I don't think I've ever given that a whole lot of thought, or not nearly not as much until um, since we've been doing these Bible studies together. So just so grateful for this. Yeah. I know, when Jeremy told me that this week, and I thought, what a great idea. And he, he said he actually, you know, that's his form of punish, <laughs> punishment for thinking that. Like pulling over, he says he wastes his time, wastes five or ten minutes sitting by the side of the road, <laughs> smacking himself, <laughs> telling himself to wake up from that anger. And it, it's a reminder. I thought, well, that, that's so great. It's like giving a little kid a timeout. And I, I'm glad, Mary asked me to write that on there, and I'm glad, because I probably wouldn't have thought to write that on there. Well, it was, a, it was a wonderful idea, and it is true. This is, it's this humility and willingness to share these things. That's how we help each other and admit we've got the problem. That's why our testimonies, for the most part, are so wonderful, because people aren't so prideful. They're not getting up and saying, I'm so great, and I know all these quotes, and my life is wonderful, and yours isn't, and then sit down. <laughs> Exactly how you feel. <laughs> and and oh. it wasn't always so, but that was one of the great things about Mrs. Evans' teachings, which was regular. Which is, we had classes like every week. 
She would talk about her own experiences. She would divulge things about her own personal life that <laughs> I would sometimes wonder, gee, I don't think I would ever divulge that. But she always made uh, a lesson out of it for, for the rest of us. And I think it really taught us all to not be ashamed of anything, to not hide anything, and, and, and demand a blessing from every experience we ever have. And it was, it was, it was great teaching. And, that, and we're doing our best to impart that quality. <laughs> yeah, no, it's true. So she had a lot of humility, I think it. Yes, she did. She did. Mm -hmm. She Which did. is really important because, you know, I never liked reading the lesson before, and I always, I, I said this, you know, I, I would read the science and health, but before I, and now I even read the lesson, so I'm really grateful that I understand little bits of it now. And I even have an idea about what the New Testament is, and so I'm really grateful that I can participate in these writing roundtables. Mm-hmm. And um, I realized that I've had to totally rethink Christian science. It's like a language I thought I knew, but I learned badly. Well, thank you. We've, and we've all been there, so we understand. Here we are. Here we are. Here we all are. And I just want to say one thing. You know, Jeremy's lesson about dealing with traffic and, and anger in traffic, and it, it's such a good life lesson because... You know, we're, we're, we're always in traffic whenever we're around other people, whether it's driving a car or you know, in a business meeting yeah. or, you know, or, or, you know, walking in a crowd or, or whatever. Traffic, you know, when you're doing something, traffic's there and it's, this, it's all mental. And that's the importance of guarding our thoughts. And, you know, pulling over in a car to guard your thought is one thing, but, you know, when you're walking or when you're sitting or in, in traffic, um, it, it's, we, we, we all have to discipline ourselves to guard our thought. Yeah, and that's why, you know, we say, Hail Son of God when we're out seeing people. And also, you know, when you're traveling in a car, don't be idle in what you're thinking, but put a blessing. Your, your people, your passing people in cars, send out your love to them and know that, as we've been taught here, that God is behind the wheel of your car and the wheel of every other car on the road. And bless and love all these people around you. Let them feel your love. Why not do, be doing that instead of just, you know, mulling over the day's events? We should always... That, that quote about the place always being better for you having passed by. Your right thought should always bless every place you go. Everyone should feel that blessing. And even if it is a simple hail, son of God, they will feel it. They will feel blessed by that because it's the truth with a capital T. Yeah. How about the traffic? Can you tell them? Sometimes the traffic is actually caused by good reason, but if you're not, like Jeremy says, if you're, if you're not praying about it, we, we will not be able, or we deny ourselves the opportunity to see those good reasons. And one of the, why I'm saying this is this, this time of the year is when the, the companies, the engineers that repair the roads or construct new roads, that's when they are out doing this job. And if you're not in the right mind, you may not see them or recognize them and being able to see the good work they are doing. Because yourself, sir, thank you. <laughs> and you, you deny yourself the opportunity to see these good men and women spending time doing this wonderful work, which some of us may not have the um, skill to do ourselves. But because we are so upset, we drove past them every day without sharing that good thought with them. And uh, I think it's right to sit back like Jeremy did, and let God open our eyes to see some of those things. Thank Good. you. Okay, I guess we should yep. move on, Connie. How are we doing, Connie? Uh, we're, we're late. <laughs> we're late. <laughs> yeah. um, what does it mean to give place to the devil? I kind of think we've covered this, but does anybody have anything? <clears throat> to 
me, it's the empty house. Uh, a human off guard. And allowing the devil to come back in. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I've, I've mentioned at times, you know, when you when you are listening to this steady stream of the old man conversation, you are giving place to the devil. It is if you have invited him, I think of it this way, you've invited him into your house, you've poured the tea, you're sitting there talking to him, <laughs> listening to everything he has to say with great earnest and interest. I mean, why be so stupid? It's true. That's exactly what you are doing. You're giving place. You, you've made room for him in your mental house. That's why that sign should be on you, everyone. This place has changed hands. I dwell in the secret place of the Most High. That's the place that I'm in. So don't you even come a-knocking on my door again. It reminds me. It's, it's, uh, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I think it's even worse when you actually take the claim and own it and make it, you know, I think we've mentioned it before, my this, my high blood pressure, my this, my that. Yeah, right. I think that's really given place to it. And it's, it's in a sense, that's sinful. God didn't make it, so why own it? That's wonderful. Thank you. No, that's uh, a good point, because if you, if you attach one error to yourself, if you admit one error, that error invites all of its brothers and sisters and cousins. <laughs> okay. Yeah, you'll have a big party going on there. <laughs> hey, if you give it an inch, it's going to take a while. Absolutely. Stop it. Stop it early. Not your friend. Think of the allegory of Adam and Eve. What was Eve's mistake? Listen to, Listen to Adam. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a new take on that. Yeah. <laughs> that was probably a mistake, yes. <laughs> oh, fact, what did I mean? <laughs> but she did worse than that. She allowed herself to have a conversation with the serpent. She didn't dismiss the serpent when it was a little, tiny little snake. And it grew in Revelation to be a big red dragon. Yeah, so catch it early on and dwell in the secret place of the Most High. Do not, do not invite the devil into your home and listen. Please don't. That's very bad. <laughs> and Jesus did, Jesus did that a few, many times when he told the devil to get thee behind him. Mm -hmm. Yes, even, absolutely. Even when it was coming from somebody he loved so much, one of his dearest disciples, Peter. Peter, right. Yeah, he still, he wasn't, uh, wasn't uh, he didn't go back to Tapia to get thee behind him. He wasn't telling Peter, but he was addressing the, uh, the erroneous thought coming through Peter. Him. Yes, he rebuked the arrow. It was yeah. an offense to him. Yeah. And we must be willing. If, and, and when you rebuke it in your own thought, you will be able to help others and rebuke it in their thought too. And it will not be personal. You will not think of it as theirs or yours. It will be an impersonal thing. And that's a great, wonderful growth when you get where you can see it impersonally with you and impersonally with others. It's not your error and it's not anyone's. I read somewhere that uh, there's no talking serpents, so don't talk to them. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. Okay, Connie, any more? <clears throat> okay. Um, how is it that not offending with words makes one able to bridle the whole body? Well, if you have control over what you're, is coming out of your mouth, um, you have complete government over yourself. Thank you. Yeah, because what comes out of your mouth is a reflection of what's in your thoughts. Mm -hmm. And if what comes out of your mouth is pure, is right, that says something about your thoughts, right? 
And what's in your in your thought comes from what's in your heart. So it shows what you love and that you're loving. Mm -hmm. I couldn't help but think after reading the lesson, you know, the tongue got a pretty bad shot here. <laughs> The tongue is simply an instrument of what's in the heart. As we said before, there's nothing hidden that won't be revealed. If there's something in your heart, guess what? That tongue is going to blab it out somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> so please, do your that dear tongue a little favor so you can clean out the heart. <laughs> yeah, I've, you know, have you ever said something and then later regretted that you said it? Or, you know, gee, I'm sorry, I, I'm sorry I said that, or I wish I hadn't said that. Oh, never, never. <laughs> well, you know, we're sorry because it offended somebody or did or harm somebody or did some harm, but we should be sorry that it was in our heart in the first place. I thought this was such an interesting question because it really uh, made me think about the fact that everything is on a mental level, all existence. And uh, it's all about words, it's the thoughts we think, the words we use to communicate our thoughts to others. I mean, in the Gospel of John, it, creation is described as in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. I mean, words are our weapon for destroying evil, if they're used correctly, if we're using the Word of God. But words are also weapons that can destroy others. Um, the mortal sense of communication. So I, I think it's it's a huge thing for us as Christian scientists. I, for me, when I think about the factor, try to remind myself that you know it's all about my words. Am I using the word of God to to rebuke evil and to bless others? Thank you, Sana. So true. I remember years ago. I'll never forget this. It was it was the uh, president of Brown University. She was giving a graduation speech. And her major, her thing, was communication. And that speech was so interesting because she said communication, by far, is the most entire, most important thing in the entire universe. <laughs> and then she made points as to, as to say how. Because one person could describe a, a, one incident, the same incident. One person describes it one way. Another person describes it the other way. It was all words, how they communicated. And it reminds me, because yesterday I saw, I was watching the news briefly, but it was a minister and a psychologist talking about the protests in Baltimore. The minister <laughs> made beautiful sense to me. Sounded just absolutely right on. The psychologist I couldn't understand. It was such gobbledygook. And yet, if I didn't know or have any sense of who's who and what's what, maybe I might believe that psychologist. I mean, heaven knows she had all these degrees, and she spoke well, but what she said was gobbledygook. Well, what the minister said, of course, he brought everything back to God. He was, he was right, easily understood. So words are important, yes. Are we the other thing I, I would just like to mention is too. You, some people use words to cover up a multitude of sins. So that's something else. And if anyone tries to do that, that will sooner or later be brought to light. And, and if you're spiritually minded, and and someone is just talking the talk and not walking the walk, it will it will literally probably make you sick. It will turn you off to that because of the. Uh, hypocrisy of it. So what if you just can't communicate what your thoughts are? Then God, then ask God to give you what you need. If you love, you, you won't be able, you won't be able to help but communicate in one way or another. It'll be impossible not to communicate something if you really love. Yeah, you it add, will be coming from God. It, it will be coming from wisdom, the heart. Yeah, what Moses is was a great what, example of that. 
What was that? I said Moses was a, a very good example of that. Yes, he said, I'm, I'm uneloquent, I can't speak. And God said what? Who made your mouth? Who made your mouth? And the human words are just covering, it's just a big cover. It can be, but when you when you really want to reach someone, heart speaks to heart, you ask God if you feel you can't communicate. Mrs. Eddy says eloquence is in God, and, and those who thought they were uneloquent become eloquent when they let God speak through them. Jeremy wrote a lesson recently. What, what, were, what was that story about Jesus and his disciples? Who shall be greatest? No. They were going out and they were worried about what they would say. Oh, that's right. Yeah. And he said, don't worry because in that hour it'll be delivered to you. Yes. Oh, that's right. Don't Sorry, we'll do a lot of iteration. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> but what does Mrs. Eddy say about communication? She says it very specifically. The communication is from God to man. Exactly. Thank you. Exactly. It says something else. Of, something explains the fervor of untutored lips. And I don't have yeah. the full statement in front of me right now. I think it's eloquent. But if we have something worth sharing, what I mean was sharing something uplifting, you would be eager to share it. You will not be holding back. If you're holding back, you better ask yourself if it's actually coming from God. God will give you the strength to do so. Thank you. And I think each one of us, when we first came to this church, were at first somewhat reluctant to give a testimony, to, to speak in public on a Wednesday evening. One of them. Mm -hmm. I've never done it before. <laughs> right. My foot used to shake when I'm doing it. <laughs> <laughs> well, not anymore. No, that's right. You get, you get yourself out of the way and you let God use you. And he will, and you will become eloquent. And eloquence is just the heart speaking to heart. I, I, I was just thinking of Jesus a lot of times when... When people ask him things, he didn't respond. So maybe whatever you think you need to explain really doesn't need to be explained or, or isn't going to go anywhere. And that's why you're not getting the answer. Good, Good point. Sometimes maybe. you to... Silence is golden. Go ahead, Elsie. I was going to say it may be that he's saying, what, if you remember the story we had uh, where a woman went to uh, have a healing and she went on about all of her problems and the woman she was speaking with said taint so taint so right taint so honey <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah it's a beautiful story so does that answer your question Luann I guess so I think we're going to have to discuss that <laughs> discuss what? We just did. <laughs> Questions answered. In any event, it planted a seed. We'll let that seed grow. And remember, you can't, Luann, you can't. You can't do it. Only God can. So if you think you can, it's because you have a big sense of yourself. And that's true about anyone, and I, I say it to my own self, if there's something I think I can't do, because I think I'm trying to do it, and I don't know that God is doing it. And that's always the point. Get yourself out of the way, and God exactly will. Exactly, yes, exactly, because you try, if you're in it trying to do it, you're trying, oh, is the comma right, or did I put the, you know, this here correctly? You, you're all in it, and then get whoever out of the way and let God do it, and he does it. Right. And if you've done it and it's not being met with respect, then you do, as Jeremy said, just be quiet and leave it alone. Not up to you to try to keep thinking that you've got to get some words to convince somebody. No. And again, that's a false sense of self. You don't cast your pearls. And, and what... Uh, 
what Florence was talking about is that is the what it means to not offend with words. When you're able to speak the words that will bless, that means that God is using your mouth. But God is governing your thoughts. That means you're listening to him. You've kicked the devil out. You're no longer giving place to the devil. And even if at first maybe they don't like what you're saying, you're still blessing them, um, and eventually they will realize that. Probably do at the moment. They just don't want to admit to it. Okay, where are we, Connie? Well, the next question, which I think Gary pretty much just answered, in many things we offend all. What does this mean? Matthew Henry says we are all sinners. <laughs> That's very encouraging. <laughs> oh, another one was we all stumble in many ways. <laughs> Speak for yourself. <laughs> <laughs> well, sometimes they'll say something that really, um, really puts a pall uh, on the situation, and it shows what's in my thought. No, when I write here, I want, I'm not sure if that's what the person who put this question was referring to. But my take from it was, if you're a Christian, or somebody who is listening to God instead of man, you will not be afraid to offend people, or you'll be more afraid to offend God. But when you strive not to offend God, you probably will be offending people, because your view may not be the popular view. And it upsets people who are in, there, in the right mind. But we should be focusing on not offending God. Because here, Jesus, the story in the lesson here, when Jesus was speaking, he offended the Pharisees by his actions. But his actions were pleasing to God. And that's my take. That's very good. I think that's a very good take. Right. Right. I could. I couldn't agree more. I think that is the very uh, problem we're facing in our nation today. This uh, difference between offending God and offending men. Uh, I mean, this shift away from God and traditional family values, and people are afraid to say anything, or they're going to be offending somebody out there. It's politically incorrect to say the things that are the highest right to say today, because it might be an offense to someone. And we have found ourselves in a terrible predicament because of it. Thank you. Yep. That's for sure. Yes, it. And that's why this is what Benjamin said. Don't do not be afraid to offend men. To offend men. I, there was there was a news guy on the news once, and um, he, he was so funny because there was some politically incorrect way of calling someone. <laughs> and anyway, it, it just made him so mad that, you know, all this political correctness. So he just started spewing that word over and over and over. <laughs> it was just, just to show how silly it is. It's just a word. Um, you know, we, Mrs. Eddy says, do not be offended unless the offense be to God. And to, to take that article and work with that and not be offended unless the offense be to God. Um, you know, people are going to say things. Get over it. Don't let it just knock you out of the box. It's ridiculous. We tiptoe around. We can't even speak the truth as God would see it and say it. No. It's, an, it's important we understand this. And, and yes, you will end up probably offending a lot of people. But if the offense isn't to God, then okay. I think we're talking about the last question. <laughs> it's yeah. probably just as well because it's a lovely fun. Yeah, we. Could, I was saying if we ran over, we could do do this tomorrow. If anyone else would speak to that too about offending, I would be glad to hear anyone else. Well, Jesus' response says that every tree that wasn't planted by the Father is going to be rooted up. So if you offend somebody and it's not godly, hey, it's going to be rooted up anyway. Well. Yes. 
move on with it. Yes. No one gets away with anything. You don't have to think that they do. You will reap what you sow. I remember working on a relationship problem with a <coughs> practitioner, and the practitioner said to me, who are you trying to please? And it made me really think I was trying to please person, not God. And that changed the whole situation. Very good. For the better. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely for the better. Yes. The right thing. Anyone mm -hmm. else? Any more yeah, questions? It, it's all in your motive, either to help or to hurt. Thank you. That sums it up very well, Jean. That's true. It's in your motive. And if your motive is to help, then whatever you say is okay. But if it's to hurt, you can oh. try to cloak it all you want, but very bad. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's a good ending. We can finish the other question or questions tomorrow. Connie? Sure. Great. Okay. Thank you, Connie. Thank, Thank you, Connie. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.